The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You are now tuned in to the PA Power Podcast, College Edition, featuring Tristan Warner, Mason Beckman, and Super Rob Walco. PA Power Wrestling. PA Power Wrestling. Pennsylvania is wrestling. Pennsylvania wrestling fans, welcome back. This is episode one of the PA Power College Wrestling Podcast for the 2019-2020 season. I'm your co-host Tristan Warner, joined today by Rob Waltko. A little different look to the podcast this year for um, listeners who have been with us in the past. Rob and I will be tackling this episode. Another collaborator will be Mason Beckman. He was on the podcast two years ago. He will also be joining us on some episodes so a little different look to the podcast this year, but Rob, I just got to say, as a middle school kid, loved wrestling, grew up uh, all over the PA wrestling forums, and I saw you on the PA, uh, what was it, Wrestling Report forums back in the day as Super Rob PA, and I uh, used to follow all your posts, so kind of crazy to think now, we've crossed the bridge into retirement, and now we're sitting here talking about wrestling, we got our own podcast. Yeah, come a long way, uh, it's nice to know that I'm a hero of someone that I'm co-hosting with, so that's always feels good. But uh, yeah, looking forward to having some fun this season. Just a quick rundown of how these uh, first couple episodes are going to go. We're now already through mid-October, so just a few weeks before college wrestling season gets underway. That is hard to believe, by the way. But um, for the first few episodes, we're going to go ahead and preview. Um, going to try to get to all the PA Division One wrestling programs by the first week of competition, if possible. Today, we're going to start with the Big Gun, Penn State, and also Pitt. So we'll go through a team preview of both of those programs. Also, we're fortunate to be joined with an interview by Cole Matthews, a redshirt freshman for Pitt this year, Um, a highly touted recruit out of Reynolds who projects at 141 for the Panthers this year, and big things are expected from him in the PA wrestling community. And also, we're going to go through a weight-by-weight preview of some of the top Pennsylvania guys that headline those weight classes. Today we're going to go through 125 to 157, so the first half of the weight classes. Um, Rob and I will take a look at some of your big dogs from Pennsylvania that will be looking to make a splash on the national scene this year. Also, one new segment we're going to throw in this year, and uh, starting with this episode, Rob, we've been around the block with wrestling for so long. Um, we've watched so much wrestling from the time we were kids all the way up till now. That we're on the other side. I feel like we'd be remiss to not just reflect back on some of the best memories we've had um, watching these stud guys compete from all these programs. So starting with Penn State and Pitt today, at the end we're going to get to some of our favorite matches or favorite wrestlers that we've seen over the years from those respective programs. So yeah, do you want to jump into this Penn State preview? I think it's only fitting that we talk about them first. Yeah, Penn State, obviously. Um, the top dogs right now, the team to dethrone at the moment. Um, led by, obviously, head coach Kale Sanderson, assistant coaches Cody Sanderson, <clears throat> Jake Varner, and Casey Cunningham. So, Rob, you want to start off with our 125, a little bit of a different lineup for Penn State this year. Obviously, they've got some of the big guns back, but losing J- uh, Jason Nolf and Bo Nickel to graduation, um, among others, a little bit of a different look this year. Yeah, no, they're uh, they're definitely mixing it up a little bit. I have to say, I think they're lightweights. Uh, they have more potential for points at 33 and 41 than I think they've had in a long time. And, and they really haven't scored many at 25. So Teske uh, certainly could, could break through and, and outlast or outplace a lot of those guys. But yeah, jumping right into it, you know, uh, Brody Teske, uh, when he was in high school was, was kind of the guy that was last to sign. If I recall at 125. So a lot of schools that needed life for 125s were, were after him and it seemed to come down to Iowa state and Penn state and uh, he, he ended up at Penn State, obviously. Uh, last year, didn't have, honestly, a great season. It was very limited. Uh, he was 6-2. and two. He, he went lost a couple matches at the scuffle. Uh, won some matches at 133, which was surprising because he's not that big. Um, got teched by Luke Warner from Lock Haven. Uh, UWWs, he ended up beating Camacho, who is a guy that a lot of people ha- are, are high on down at NC State. So we'll see with him. I mean, he's in a tough room. I think he's a kid that that works very hard and has a high upside. So I imagine that he'll, he'll improve off of that, but you know, not guaranteed points. Uh, 33, you know, you got Bravo young, who's currently ranked sixth uh, via flow, 
but that is with a lot of guys, Michich, Fix, etc., that are in there that are, are looking to take red shirts. So he could really climb. Uh, realistically, he, he has a good shot to make the finals. He can make a jump, uh, I think, from eighth place into second or third. I mean, I think Gross and Pletcher are the guys going to be ranked ahead of him. Uh, he's beaten Pletcher before. Uh, my gut feeling is he's going to make a big jump this year. Uh, you know, obviously in placing, but I, I think he's going to open it up and, and beat some guys worse that maybe he was close to. And then Nick Lee, he, he's ranked number two. This might be his best chance to win a title with Yanni on red shirt. Uh, Demas is ranked number one for them. Uh, I think it's a match he can win. He got kind of dominated at nationals, but I think Lee and Demas are, are probably at the top right now. And then you got Shoop uh, from Lock Haven, uh, McKee, uh, Grant Leith, and then maybe Austin DeSanto are going to be pushing them. But I think right now Nick Lee is, is cemented, at least for the time being, at number two. Uh, Tristan, what do you think about these Penn State lightweights? How are they looking to you? I think it's an interesting uh, start to the lineup, like you said. Um, Teske definitely is a guy that comes in with a really good high school pedigree. Like you said, he may not have had the red shirt campaign that Penn State wrestling fans were expecting or maybe wanted to see. But then again, you never know. There's so many things that go into it, especially as a freshman coming in, uh, making the transition to high school. Sometimes it takes guys a couple years to figure it out. Sometimes guys are battling illness or injury, and we just don't know about it. Um, there's so many times where that those kind of scenarios shake up, and then you know Brody Teske comes out here and is a top ten guy, and people are you know, thinking, you know, how did he get uh, you know tech falled by that kid from Lock Haven or whatever. So you know, I don't know that I would let a red shirt season that didn't go as planned. Um, be anything to make anyone shy away from picking him as being a stud for Penn State. Plus, it's Penn State. Guys who go to Penn State get really good, obviously. Um, he's got stud workout partners in the room, so I, I still expect that he's going to be a really good contributor to this lineup. And then, like you said, at 133, Roman Bravo Young obviously already had a great freshman campaign, um, All-American as a freshman, and then now that weight class has just been kind of vacated by a lot of these top guys, especially just in the last month. If you look at the rankings from September to now, even a two or three more more guys, I believe, have declared for that Olympic redshirt. So RBY just kind of rising to the top of those rankings. So he's obviously going to be a title contender now at that weight class. And Nick Lee, like you said, same thing. Um, he's becoming a little bit more of a veteran now. He's got a couple years under his belt. Um He's a guy that just just wrestles hard the full seven minutes and scores points, and um, that's another weight class that with Yanni out, I believe Ironman's out now too, the Olympic red shirt, so that weight class is open as well. And that brings me up to 149. I'll take the reins. Uh, looks like Jared Verclearen is probably going to be your starter. He battled Brady Berge last year, kind of in and out of the lineup. These two split time. Verclearen posted like a 11 or 12 and 6 record. Um, he had some quality wins. He got in got in some dual meets. Um, had some really tough losses also. I know he lost 3-2 to two to Caden Feller from Oklahoma State at the Southern Scuffle. That was one of his notable matches that he was right there. Also lost a heartbreaker 10-8 to eight to Micah Jordan, who was ranked 3rd at the time in the dual meet in February. So he's proven that he can contest with the top 10 guys in the country. No doubt about that. Um, and he's obviously proven himself on the world stage too as a Fila Cadet world champ. So it's just a matter of time before that translates into folk style here as he'll be a uh, red shirt freshman, I believe. Red shirt sophomore, sorry. And also moving up to 157, Brady Berge bumps up a weight class this year. He was your 12 seed at NCAA's last season. Um, fell just short of All-American status, but nonetheless a pretty solid freshman campaign. And uh, moving up this year, already ranked in the top five, fifth by Flow Wrestling in a weight class that's been vacated by Jason Nolf. You got um, fellow PA boy Hayden Hydley at the top of those rankings. So Bergie looking to get in the mix and shake things up there at 157. Yeah, I'm excited for these two guys. Uh, Verclair, and like you said, a little bit up and down last year. Um, I remember he looked absolutely horrible versus uh, Amin in the dual meet. But like you said about Teske, you never know when a guy's battling an injury or a bug. Uh, the word I, that a lot of people heard after that was he didn't know till last minute he was going to wrestle and cut a bunch of weight, uh, you know, within a day to get down to 49 and, you know, ran out of gas. I mean, there's no really other way to put it. And then the next week goes out there and wrestles Michael Jordan, Jordan tough as nails. So I think he shows the potentials there when he's on. And then, you know, Burgie was, was I don't want to say up and down last year. He just he really wasn't 
that great, but the rumors there were that he was more of a natural 57 pounder. Uh, wanted to get in the lineup, so had to wrestle off Nolf, or had to go down rather than wrestle off Nolf. So maybe he struggled with weight, but he's someone that they're really high on, and he's had some freestyle success. Uh, so I, th- I think he's a guy to look out for. You know, really getting into the, the meat of their lineup, you know, 65 and up. I mean, they're good everywhere, right? But 65 and up, I mean, you have two national champs right away in Chenzo and Hall. You know, both guys had lost in the finals last year. Uh, Chenzo lost to Makai Lewis, who's Olympic redshirting. Um, Massa's out, Olympic redshirt. So on, on paper, looks like Chenzo, the bull, who he struggled with, and McFadden are kind of the guys to beat. And then Hall, really 74. I mean, it, it really uh, it really clears out for him. Uh, assuming he wrestles and doesn't redshirt, you know, Zahid goes up, Amin's on redshirt. Uh, it looks like it's him and a, a couple PA boys. Keber, Labriola, and Cutler are, are probably going to be pushing him. Uh, Kemmer is the interesting one for me. He's coming up a lot of weight, but he's, he's pretty darn skilled. Um, yeah, at this point in, in the game, Penn state is looking at four title contenders, uh, right through 74 and then 84. You have another guy that was the number two seed last year. Uh, Shakur Rashid, he had a very poor tourney. Uh, he was the two seed and, and ended up going one and two or two and two. Uh, that's pretty uncharacteristic for Penn state. They don't lose a lot of surprising matches at the nationals, uh, but he's a guy that, He's, I mean, he's he's more the the boomer bus guy. I think in their lineup than anyone. He could make the finals alongside uh, Zahid, or he could not place. I mean, that's a pretty deep weight. There's a lot of guys in there that can wrestle with him. I mean, I think you're looking at big points at 65, 74, you know, 84. If they put up big points, they're going to be really hard to beat. Uh, but if they don't, you know, maybe it cracks that door open for Iowa. Uh, Tristan, how do you see this playing out for these guys? Yeah, like you said, uh, this is really the heart and soul of this lineup. Um, Chenzo coming back for his last year. Um, looking to get that third NCAA title uh, definitely helps that Makai Lewis is out, but not to say that Chenzo wouldn't avenge that loss. Um, definitely looked a little off in the finals, but that's not taking anything away from Makai Lewis. He's extremely talented and extremely athletic, and he came to wrestle that night. But regardless, like you said, uh, I see Chenzo getting a title here at 65. And I also see Mark Hall going for that bookend national title, if you will, um, winning it as a freshman and then maybe taking the title as a senior. But like you said, Michael Kemmer, this is interesting. We've never seen him at this weight class before. Um, 157 two years ago and then got hurt, was out all of last year. So he is a tall guy. I could see him filling out the weight class, but Mark Hall going to be really tough to beat at 174. And Shakur Rashid, like you said, he... Uh, you see a different Rashid every now and then. He um, has a ton of skill. He's can do some really flashy things. He can wrap you up in a cradle and pin you at any time. And then uh, at NCAA's last year, got picked off by uh, an unassuming Chip Ness from UNC, and I think the round of 16, which I don't think very many people saw coming. But I will also say Rashid looked to have hurt his knee. I know he defaulted out of the tournament after that, I, I think, or he at least wrestled, but he, he clearly... I think he ended up losing to Dakota Gear, another PA boy, but he didn't look like he had any stamina in that knee. So I don't know the circumstances, but I think Rashid will be back and um, ready to go. But it is interesting, Rob. Um, I don't know if you mentioned, but Aaron Brooks is also for Penn State at 184. He took a gray shirt last year. He still has the capability to red shirt. So assuming Rashid finishes out his eligibility, Brooks will be waiting in the wings there. But you never know. He's... Um, one of the most talented guys in the country coming in. So you never know if he'll contest for that spot. Yeah. The, uh, if, if Rashid, Rashid struggles or gets hurt, I mean, whatever it is, they have depth. And that's something that you know, Penn state really hasn't had a ton of recently. It's like, they got their eight, nine guys and you know, their bench is pretty weak. But uh, with that class that they recruited two years ago, a lot of them, the gray shirt, they're, they're on campus now. Uh, they're going to provide a lot of depth. Uh, yeah. Talk about their, their big guys, Tristan. What, what are you looking at up top? 197 is interesting, too, because obviously one of the greats of the last decade, Bo Nickel, is, um, has exhausted his eligibility. So Kyle Connell from transfer from Kent State, now a, oh, I want to say like a 60-year senior. He was wrestling. He was like a sophomore when I was a senior, and that was like four years ago. So this guy has been around for a long time, um, usually in a golden flash of singlet. But this year he's a Nittany Lion. Um he was the shock of the NCAA tournament in 2018. Came in unseated. He pins the top seed 
Colin Moore from Ohio State in like a minute and 30 seconds and then um, falls to eventual champ Mike Machiavello from NC State in the semis but then comes back proving that he's no fluke and beats Colin Moore again for third. And, and he had never really had those type of wins to his uh, pedigree to that point in his career. He'd always been a solid guy, a top 20 guy, but nobody saw that coming. He really shocked the wrestling world and then really drew some attention and ended up transferring to Penn State. Now, he did take a year off last year. So what will be interesting to see is, I don't know, I don't want to say he's got a bullseye on his back, but he's kind of got a, he's kind of got the buzz going around him that, was that a fluke or not? Kyle Connell is going to be out there to prove himself in a Penn State single this year that that was no fluke and that he can take a whole year off and come back and still be a top three guy. He's currently ranked number three by Flo. And also, backing him up, Penn State has a super freshman in Mike Beard, who, uh, out of Malvern Prep, has been a stud high school kid in the last few years, and um, he will be backing Connell up. So if uh, if Connell doesn't live up to the bill, you always got Beard in there. But I think I think Connell is going to be a solid 97-pounder for Penn State. Will he live up to the third ranking? That remains to be seen. And at 285, obviously, returning champ Anthony Kassar coming back. He also got a sixth year um, looking to defend his title. Two-horse race between him and Gable Stevenson at the top. Those two... Um, neck and neck, but Kassar able to pull out, pull it out when it mattered last year. No, I couldn't agree more, Tristan. I I think ninety seven, you know, Beard. He's I think he's probably good enough in a lot of people's eyes to All American right now. So if Connell sputters or he kind of uh, you know, he dips back to to what he was for the majority of his career, they're not going to hesitate to pull Beard out if they need those points. Um, but you got to think Connell's probably getting better in that room, but you never know, right? And then heavyweight, yeah, what, what can you say about Kassar? I think there was speculation that he wasn't going to come back this year. And, uh, you know, Penn State really pushed for him to come back. Uh, he really has two more years if he wants. Uh, he he looked great last year. I'm excited to see him and Gable get it on, but he's got to be the guy for now. I also just want to throw in there, you got, um, yeah, like you said about Kyle Connell. I mean, him making the move to Penn State, you just think about the workout partners that he's had. Um, you got – Obviously, some of the best upperweights in the country, but now you just got Kyle Snyder coming to the Nittany Line Wrestling Club, and uh, you already got Kale Sanderson and Jake Farner. It's it's almost like it's not even fair the kind of workout partners that you get as a big man at Penn State. Yeah, that's a great point. He uh, you definitely don't hurt for partners there, and yeah, I mean the, about that Snyder move, I was I was a bit surprised. Um, you know, Mason didn't seem to be too shocked, but what did you think of that, Tristan? When is Mason ever shocked? Yeah, I, I didn't see it coming. I never heard any rumors about that. Mason always seems to be a step ahead of everybody else, but I did not see that coming. However, I, I understand from Kyle Snyder's standpoint why, um, you know, that's the best place to train in the world. If, you, if you're if you a big, big man and you're looking to win an Olympic title, look at the guys you have surrounding you. And on the other counter side of that, if you're a college wrestler in the 84, 97 heavyweight range, I mean, you cannot beat a wrestling room with Kale Sanderson, Jake Farner, and uh, now Anthony Kassar, Bo Nickel, guys like that. I mean, you really cannot beat it. No, you, you nailed it on the head, man. And that being said, that pretty much wraps it up for our Penn State preview. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to another school, just a little maybe three hours southwest down in your neck of the woods, Rob, the Pitt Panthers. We're going to start off with Penn State and Pitt for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and start it off at 125. Pitt is coached by Keith Gavin, assistant's Associate head coach, excuse me, Jordan Lean. Assistants, Drew Headley and Connor Utsi. Um, a solid team here. A young team that's really heading in a positive direction. Um, also got some flashy new singlets in the last year or two. I like the color change that Pitt made. So uh, that being said, and also Pitt fresh off of hosting the NCAA championship. So that was cool um, having the, the tournament here in our neck of the woods. I'm going to go ahead and jump in at 125. So so Pitt is kind of deep here at 125 with some talented kids. Um, three of them from Pennsylvania, one from Ohio. Um, Brandon Fenton was the starter last year. Went 7-14 and 14 in dual meets um, as a freshman. Maybe looking to improve on that as a sophomore, but he's also going to be paced by a couple really talented young Pennsylvania kids at the weight. Um, our, our One of our insiders, Mason Beckman, telling us that some of these guys will for sure be taking red shirts, but um, definitely worth mentioning at the weight class. You got Colton Camacho out of Franklin Regional. He was a PIAA state finalist and nationally ranked wrestler. He will be at the weight class as well as Ryan Sullivan from Shaler, 
couple time PA state placer and a PA state champ. Maybe a little undersized is why he may be taking a red shirt. And also Lewis Newell from Seneca Valley, um, another guy that was in the PA state finals at least twice. All of these guys will provide depth at that weight class. Um, as of now, I'd say Fenton might be getting the nod again, but he's definitely going to be paced by a couple of really talented kids at that weight. Um, moving up to 133, Mickey Phillippe. He's ranked seventh going into this season. He was in the blood round last year as a red shirt. He had freshman eligibility. I, I call him Ferris Bueller. <laughs> classic, classic. So red shirt sophomore Mickey Phillippe. Um, after transferring in from UVA, had a really – Solid campaign, even beat um, NCAA runner-up Dayton Fix in the dual meet. It was the first one to hand fix a loss in college, I believe. So, uh, Philippi's proven he's right there at the top with anybody. Um, lost a heartbreaker in the blood round to um, Roman Bravo Young, who we just talked about. And uh, actually got got taken down by a fellow Whippeal native, Luke Pletcher, from Ohio State in the quarters. So, he was right there on the edge of uh, being an All-American as a redshirt freshman and Philippi, you look at his scores a lot of close matches but he really finds ways to pull out those close matches he's very stingy very tough to score on good on top so uh he's really there to compete with anybody in the country rob what do you think about these 25 and 33 pounders for Pitt? yeah i think they look good i think 25 is a question mark obviously fenton didn't have great results last year uh if he's the guy he's going to need to show improvement but i mean he was a true freshman thrown to the wolves so it's not outside the realm of possibility that he can make a jump. Um, my gut tells me Camacho will be the guy. Uh, Sullivan's going to redshirt. Camacho is pretty big, I think, so it might make sense to wrestle him this year and then redshirt him for a year and kind of figure out where he's going to go after that. Uh, Philippi's a beast, man. I think stingy is the best word for it. He's, he's very good on top. He is uh, extremely hard to score on. He's very long. He just knows how to win close matches. Uh, it was it was tough to watch him you know, not hit his goal at Nationals last year, but I think he's going to make a big jump this year as well. Um, you know, jumping up into their next guys, you know, you got Cole Matthews, who we're going to talk to later. He's ranked 22nd as a redshirt freshman. He won the Cleveland state and the Edinburgh tournament, uh, former top 50 recruit. You know, he was, he was good last year. I think he's a guy that he's going to benefit from working out with, with guys like Philippi and, uh, Romani and, and, you know, Drew Headley. So he, I expect big things out of him. Uh, 49, my, my best guess is probably Luke Kemmer or Dallas Bullsack. Uh, Bullsack was the man last year, uh, second half of the year. He took over. He wrestled in the ACCs, went 0 and 2, uh, went five and 10 on the year. So obviously not great results. And then Kemmer was 10 and seven in opens. So not really great results from him, but has, has some pedigree he placed in the state tournament. I think three times, I don't know if this is one of Pitt's stronger weights, but, um, yeah, I look for improvement. I, I hear both these kids are, are hard workers and, and do the right things. Uh, Romani, this guy, he's fun to watch. He's, uh, another blood round guy. <laughs> Pitt had three last year, which is which was hard to watch. He's ranked number nine. He's a really fun style, really funky style. Uh, he could go on a run. I, I think everyone knows he's funky, but he can seem to throw guys off their game sometimes and, and good put people on their back. So he's a big point point scorer for Pitt. You know, they get him on the podium among a few of these other guys. They could you know really break in the top ten, top fifteen. Uh, what do you think about some of those middleweights, Tristan? Uh, any guys that you really like to watch or having a big big opinion on? Well, first off, I love Cole Matthews. Um, you know, I wrestled on uh, high school summer teams with his oldest brother, Adam. Um, watched Austin coming up. Me and Austin were actually in a same NCAA bracket one year at 157. That was going back a few years. And then just a great family, a great wrestling family. Um, Cole's been coming up. Since he was little, a PJW age um, stud, and then you know now he's finally making his way into the college ranks. He's a stud recruit coming out of PA. Um, obviously, looking for big things from him at 141. Uh, like you said, he won the Cleveland State and the Edinburgh Open, so he's already proven that he can win at this at the college level. Now he's just got to translate to you know getting into the ACC schedule and uh, the grind of a full college season. But I have no doubt in my mind that he's going to be a stud for Pitt. Um, Excited to see him. And also, he is our featured interview guest for this episode. So we will be hearing from Cole um, about his journey to Pitt and uh, his outlook for his redshirt freshman campaign. And then, yeah, at 149, Luke Kemmerer is one of those guys that I feel like for years in the PIAA coming through, every year he was one of the top-ranked guys. Never did get that elusive PA state title, but um, just seemed like he, he came up just short a couple times. 
I think his senior year he might have lost in the first round even and then wrestled all the way back. But uh, that's a guy that could look look to take over that uh, 149 spot. He's obviously had a ton of wrestling experience, and he's he's been a, a big name in the PA wrestling circuit for years. And then at 157, Taylor Bermani, um, as long as it feels like his career has gone on, it also feels equally long that he's been in the blood round. I feel like he's been in college for so many years, but I also feel like he's been so close to being an All-American every single year that he's been around. He, he's one of those guys that's always in the round of 12 or always in the round of 16 in the constellations at NCAA. So um, starting the year off ranked ninth. Hopefully this is his year to get on the podium and uh, become an All-American finally. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're on the money. Um, you want to take us and, and talk about some of these guys at 65, 74, 84? Yeah, let's move right up to 165. Jake Wenzel, he's another guy that was a big PA recruit, um, national recruit, I should say, but a PA AA state champ. Um, nine and six on the year last year before getting a season-ending injury. I think it was a knee injury. Um, big, strong kid for the weight class. Um, really big 65-pounder. Really strong kid. Um, seemed like he was making some big jumps from his uh, freshman year um, moving up, but uh, obviously that injury cut his season short. Um, he's in a tough weight class in the ACC, at least with David McFadden moving back down. But uh, other guys in that weight, Bullard from NC State, um, Monday, Cam Coy, another Pittsburgh guy. Um, there's some other NCAA qualifiers in that weight, but he's definitely going to be fighting for a spot to finally get to the NCAA tournament. We hope that he's healthy this year so uh, he can finish out a whole season, but he's definitely a talented kid. He's one of those guys that was an absolute stud in high school, and it's just waiting now for him to put it all together in college and crack you know, crack that top 20, that top 15, top 10, and get his, get his trip to the NCAAs. We move up to 174. Greg Harvey, now Richard Jr. out of Boyertown. He finished just over 500 with an 11 and 10 record last year. Um, he did go 0 and 2 at the ACCs, but in a tough weight class. Um, he has a quality win over the other Bullard twin from NC State. Uh, he's the kid that looks to improve, obviously, with guys like Taylor Bermani and Nino Bonacorsi, and um, obviously the Pitt coaching staff. You got an NCAA champ in Jordan Lean, middleweight. I mean, it's just a matter of time before these guys start clicking and putting it all together. Um, so. Obviously looking for improvement from Harvey this year. And then you also got a freshman in Jared McGill out of Chestnut Ridge. He was a, a hammer in double A last year. Um, most likely we'll see him redshirt, but like we talked about with the Penn State guys, there's always these guys waiting in the wings, these young freshmen. You never know who's going to get their redshirt pulled midway through the year. Um, so he's definitely one to keep an eye on. And then moving up finally to 184, Nino Bonacorsi. So much that you can say about this guy. A redshirt freshman last year had a heartbreaking uh, end to his NCAA tournament, falling just short of All American, um, reaching the blood round. But um, enters the season ranked third now as a redshirt sophomore. That is super impressive for a guy I don't think who ever even won a state title. I believe he lost to Labriola in his um, senior PIAA state final. So that's a kid who's made leaps and bounds, and you know wrestling the same weight class that uh, Keith Gavin wrestled, I believe, or. Gavin was 74, 84 in that range. So um, under that tutelage, Bonacorsi. Gavin was a 74. Yeah, 74. Okay. Well, under his tutelage, Bonacorsi is really blossoming. So um, he's a contender at that weight class. Yeah, I like all these guys for Pitt, especially in dual meets. Harvey's not an easy out. Um, you know, he's big. He's a pinner. He's tough on top. Uh, Greg Harvey, he was you know, 0-2 at the ACCs, but he's improved a lot. I mean, that guy was not even a high state place winner, and he's going out there and he's competing – you know, at a decent level, Division One. I, I know that kids on the team really like him, and he's got a, a good reputation. So that's definitely a guy you cheer for and you hope really does well. Um, Bonnet Course, he's a guy that, you know, he used to come around and, and train with us up at Tiger Wrestling. Him and Woodley used to scrap. And, and I would wrestle with him a little in high school, and I was like, this kid's going to be really tough. And he ended up losing the finals twice at the state tournament. But, I mean, he was really, really close last year. He knocked off that Illinois kid. Uh, name escapes me. He beat him in the second round. Then Emery Parker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he kind of took it to him a little bit, and Parker ends up placing, and, and Nino didn't. He's been kind of snake bit. You know, UWWs. He's he was pounding on Max Dean and, and kind of shot himself out of the match a little bit. But um, it, it's a matter of time before that kid really breaks through. I, I think the world of him, and he's. I mean, he's the sky's the limit. That guy could he could do really really well this year. 
he's really a tech he's really a technical freak too because you look at him he's a real tall kind of lanky 84 pounder and you can almost tell by looking at him that he's a young kid you know like he walked out there at NCAAs and you're thinking yeah he's like a probably like a 19 year old kid going out there against some of these muscle heads and then Bonacorsi just takes it to him he's just got incredible technique the thing I noticed wrestling with him is he's so hard to grab like he's in and out really he understands how to control distance really well and, and you go to grab him and you know I'm old and fat so I wrestle these high school guys I just got to grab him and you know start putting my weight on him and I couldn't get a hold of him he was it was really impressive um you know up top they're, they're good here too you got Kellen Stout he was 12 and 10 on the year. He's a, he's an NCAA qualifier. Um, he lost six in a row at the end of the year. Uh, so it started the year pretty well and kind of hit a, a rough patch late, but he knows how to win matches, man. He, he wins close ones. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes. You know, I know I think it's a stretch to maybe put him in that all American category to call it right. I, it wouldn't shock me if he plays, but you can't predict that, but he's a tough out for just about anyone. He can get on a roll. And he's really, you know, made improvements because his sophomore year was really rough. I think he made a big jump this year. And then uh, Demetrius Thomas, uh, he was the eight seed last year. He's ranked 14th right now. Uh, he lost a really weird match to that Matt Stencil from Central Michigan, and then lost lost a surprising one on the back end of NCAs. But he won the ACC last year. He had a nine seven match with Derek White. Um, I think he could be in the top four, top five, no problem if he has a good tournament. I mean, you look at this pit lineup, man. Like they have a lot of guys that are really on the edge, um, have been close or, or were seated high. I think it's just a matter of time. They get one guy through; it's going to open the floodgates, and they're going to get three or four through. Uh, how do you see their big guys, and what, what do you see the outlook on them, Tristan? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like you said, both Stout and Demetrius Thomas might be kind of in the same ballpark in terms of where they're being projected to start the season. Um, Stout's obviously a veteran. He he started his career at Penn State, made the transfer to Pitt. Um, Mason and I actually had him on the show two years ago. Um, he's a guy that, like you said, didn't have the strongest end to his year last year, but uh, has had many quality wins over his career, and it's just a matter of putting it all together, especially when it matters. So kind of need the opposite to happen to him for him this year. He needs to have him put it together at the end when it counts, especially as his career is winding down. And then heavyweight Demetrius Thomas, I uh, actually had him, I remember when I filled out my NCAA bracket last year as kind of a dark horse pick. I even thought that there was a possibility he would uh, pull an upset on um, the Oklahoma State kid, Derek White, but uh didn't happen. But um, he's an athlete. He's a strong kid. He's a transfer from, uh, I want to say, an NAIA school. Williams Baptist, um, Kerry Regner, who's Millersville's head coach, yes, started that there program. You there you go. Okay, so... He's obviously made tremendous jumps over the years, and uh, he's it's just a matter of time before um, you know he starts putting together these big wins that he's had during the regular season. He gets them at the NCAA tournament. So, like you said, I think a lot of the guys on Pitt's team are really on the cusp. Like you said, you had three guys in the blood round last year, and then you have I don't know how many more that we just went through ranked in the top twelve ish, which would you know kind of foreshadow them being in the blood round. So. Um, that's a really strong team. That's a really solid team with not a lot of holes. And what's interesting, you know, this just popped into my head, but they have a lot of guys that are on the edge. I mean, you look at Jordan Lean and uh, Keith Gavin, they kind of made climbs in college, right? They didn't uh, – Lean, I mean, he won as a junior, but it was a little bit unexpected. And then Gavin came in pretty unheralded and oh, just yeah. kept getting better. So if anyone – if I'm wrestling for that team and, and those guys are in my ear – telling me uh here's how you get better or here's you know the steps you take you got to believe it and, and then the same thing with uh drew headley you know he wrestled in the international circuit for years i mean that's a good staff but i think keith is just a perfect leader if you're a a young guy that you know starts at 15 gets to 10 gets to 8 gets to 4 and keeps climbing yeah definitely like you said i, I remember both of those guys vividly in college jordan lean um was a huge recruit coming out of high school but um maybe the first two years you would say maybe not underachieved, but um, wasn't really considered a title contender. And then um, junior year makes it to the finals and beats Mike Poeta, I believe it was, from Illinois, and uh, really just put a stamp on, uh, you know, his skill. He was, uh, from there on out, he's been look, he's looked at as a incredible competitor in college and a really strong middleweight and obviously a really good coach. And then Keith Gavin, um, he's often brought up in conversation as as 
uh, in regard to guys who have not had stellar high school careers. I don't know that he was even maybe a one-time PA AA state placer from Lackawanna Trail. Um, not necessarily your household PA powerhouse uh, high school team like Reynolds or anything like that, but shows up at Pitt and just gets, keeps getting better and better and better every single year. And, you know, he's in the finals as a junior against, uh, was it Askren, I want to say? And then wins it as a senior over Herbert. So, yeah, tremendous jumps by both of those guys. And then now as coaches, um, I think they're really going to be able to do the same thing with a lot of these these young Pitt Panthers. So before we get to Cole Matthews, uh, Tristan, he's been bouncing really good ideas off of uh, Mesa and myself and Jeff the last few days. You know, in, in honor of these programs, we wanted to go over some of our favorite memories or, or things we remember, you know, watching Pitt wrestlers or Penn State wrestlers do. Um, Tristan, you want to start us off on, on a memory that you had with Penn State? Yeah, I just I just feel like you, Mason, and I together, we've just years and years and years of growing up as little kids and all the way up through middle school and high school and college. And now we've crossed the bridge into uh, sitting on the couch with our microphone and our headset on talking about these guys. We've just watched so much wrestling. We've just, you know, grown up idolizing so many of these wrestlers. I felt like it was, we'd be remiss to not mention some of our favorite memories of uh, the guys we've watched. For me personally, starting with Penn State, um, my favorite wrestler as a kid um, growing up, and it actually is ironic because then growing up into college, it's it's funny how the things change. He ended up, you know, coaching against me in the corner. But uh, Jeremy Hunter was my favorite wrestler from Penn State, a McGuffey grad out of the Whippeal, and then a uh, NCAA finalist as a junior and an NCAA champ his senior year. Um, I, I would say my best memory watching Penn State as a kid was watching him finally capture that title. I was definitely heartbroken his junior year when he. Uh, Got taken down by Steve Abbas from uh, Fresno State. That was a heartbreaker, but he came back strong the next year. Won a title over Steve Garland from UVA. And uh, that was probably my favorite wrestler growing up as a kid overall. Um, so that that's my Penn State memory. What about you? So not a guy that I necessarily looked up to because he's, he's actually a couple years younger than me. And I used to I used to battle with his brother. But Quentin Wright as a sophomore uh, coming out of the nine seed in Philadelphia, to win the national title. That was Penn state's first title. I believe uh, it was awesome because I, I used to wrestle with his brother Landis a lot. And, you know, Quentin was always a couple of years younger. He was always smaller than me. And I'll be honest. I was, I hoped he never grew into my weight class because I, I would just watch him like this kid's really tough to wrestle, but you know, he did not have a great sophomore year. He placed as a true freshman uh, red shirted and then was, was kind of hot and cold his sophomore year. And then he got to nationals and kind of beat up on everyone. I think, he, you know, I'm looking over it now. He won 8-4, 8-4, 7-3. He pinned Gambrell, then he beat Hamlin 5-2 in the finals. And just watching a guy, I'm a big underdog guy. I, I like seeing upsets. Uh, watching a guy do that was, was really cool for me. Uh, Tristan, growing up, did you ever get your hands on Quentin? Um, I'm curious. We guys had to be pretty close in age, right? Yeah, I believe Quentin was two or three years older than me. But actually, yeah, I uh... – I went to elementary and middle school in State College, and that's where he lived. He ended up going to high school at Bald Eagle area, but he was in the State College area. So I actually grew up in the same uh, area, same club, Nittany Line Wrestling Club with Quentin and Landis. So, yeah, I knew Quentin pretty well. He was obviously way better and bigger than me when we were younger, so I never really did wrestle him, maybe just uh, maybe just messing around. But, um, yeah, he was always the elite-level guy in the club um, from the days he was probably eight years old. So, um he was definitely a stud and, and continue that on all the way up through college. Yeah. And then, you know, same thing for, uh, for Pitt. you know, that's a team that, you know, I grew up in Western PA. I'm not a, a diehard Pitt guy, but you know, I follow them pretty close. I like to see them do well. And, and a good memory for me is, is Carl Fraunhofer. He came in the national tournament unseated in 2003. Uh, he won a few close matches, but he put himself in the finals versus Robbie Waller, who coincidentally, uh, I went to all American wrestling club at that point in my life. But um, it was cool to see in Fraunhofer, he, he went th- deep in the tournament. He actually was wearing a basketball jersey, a pit jersey of, uh, I think it was Brandon Knight, who was the star pit player at the time. And his explanation was, you know, no matter if they lose in the tournament, they're getting press, uh, but I have to do well to get press. So I figured I'd wear his jersey, it, kind of like a, like a backhanded compliment towards pit or just basketball in general. Um, but seeing him make that run was really cool. And even if he fell short, he fell short to a you know, guy, Robbie Waller, that I looked up to a lot. But it was just, I don't know, I like seeing a pit guy do well because I've been to a lot of their matches. Um, what about you, Tristan? Do you have any good pit memories? 
Um, growing up as a Penn State fan, I can't say that I was always a huge uh, Pitt fan, but I will say, um, like I just talked about, growing up in State College, Matt Coker, if you remember him, um, one of the nicest guys ever. He was kind of a guy I looked up to as a kid. When I was in elementary school, he was um, winning a PIAA state title. So uh, he was somebody I always looked up to. He was always great with the kids, always came in and coached and stuff. Nicest guy in the world. Um, he ended up going to Pitt and becoming an All-American in 2007 and then uh, served on the staff for a long time as a Pitt Panther coach. So um, I would just say Coker was probably my favorite Pitt wrestler and watching him finally be able to get on that podium. And he really uh, – he went from, you know, a one-time PA state champ who, you know, maybe cracked the top 20 in the high school rankings, but wasn't by any means, you know, if they had it back then, the flow, big board, you know, he wasn't that guy, but he really worked hard. He was a great dude and uh, really just made a huge name for himself in college and really turned the corner. So I was really happy to see that happen for him. He actually coaches my one boss's kid. Now, my, my boss's kid's like six or seven. Coker's helping out at Mount Lebanon down the south hills of Pittsburgh. Okay, and cool. uh, yeah, it's, yeah, my boss says he does really well with the kids. I always like Matt. He's an awesome dude. Yeah, always had a lot of respect for Coker. So, what do you say we give Cole Matthews a call? I think his bedtime's even before mine. We don't want to keep him up too late. Yeah, that's right. Let's get him uh, dialed in. We'll get some good Pit Panther talk going here. Okay, fans. Now we're lucky to be joined by Cole Matthews, who is a redshirt freshman uh, wrestling for the Pit Panthers by way of Reynolds, Pennsylvania. Uh, Cole, how are you doing this afternoon or this evening? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I think uh, you know Tristan wanted to start off with a question before we we got into anything else. Cole, thanks for being on, man. We really appreciate it. Um, my first question for you: um, What was it like growing up, um, the youngest brother, with your brother Adam Matthews, Austin Matthews, and other brother? Both of these guys have been studs in the PA wrestling circuit for years. Um, and you're also from a powerhouse school like Reynolds. What was it like growing up with these guys as your older brothers, and what all did they teach you coming up through the ranks? Uh, it was great. They've been, uh, both of them have been great influences on me. Um, I've learned a lot, just a lot of technique, a lot of uh, just like never giving up kind of, kind of stuff, but you watch your brothers and you want to be like them, and you continue to get better and grow up, but I've learned uh, from them. Growing up in a, a community like Reynolds, where you know you have two biological brothers, but a lot of guys you probably look in, up to, I mean, what was it like wrestling in a powerhouse school like that, and how much did that prepare you to wrestle at the Division One level? Um, it prepared me a lot, actually. I growing up knew that Reynolds was going to be a good team with uh, the grade above me, and uh, my grade. We were really tough. We had a lot of depth. But the tradition at Reynolds is great. Um, just being on them state championship teams was a lot of fun, and I was glad to be a leader and contribute to it. But um, taking that into college, I feel like taking pit wrestling to a more uh, team-oriented and trying to win an ACC title, is, which is our goal. But uh, I think that's making our whole team better as a as a whole. Um, great leaders like Mickey Philippi, uh, Demetrius Thomas, Kellen Stout, those older guys, they uh, they really lead the way for our team right now. Nino Bonacorsi, can't leave him out, but everybody on the team is uh, taking that leadership role and trying to get Perez and uh, be a top 10 team and hopefully compete for uh national championship soon. So it's along the same lines as Reynolds because we've been competing for state championships every uh year with them so we're just trying to get that standard here at Pitt. cool obviously you ended up at Pitt, a little bit different than high school you probably knew your whole life you're gonna end up at reynolds but you know what drew you to Pitt, and when did you really know that that was the school for you was it the only visit you took did you check out 10 other schools before that or you know why did you choose them and when did you know so Pitt, since i was a freshman i like started coming down to the PWC practices, and that's when uh, Coach Gavin wasn't the head coach here, but I always enjoyed the city itself and it being close. I knew um, since I was probably a junior that there would be a big following of Reynolds fans coming down here, which is great, and I enjoyed that. But my visits, I took a unofficial to Ryder. I took an official to Edinburgh, and I took an official to Pitt. But right when I uh, got to meet uh, Coach Gavin, Coach Lean, and 
so Jitsi, uh, for the first time, got to like spend some time with them. Those guys are great guys, and I knew that I could get better. I knew I could win here. Uh, I already knew Coach Headley. Coach Headley coached Fargo teams. I was uh, real tight with him. But everything they got, I can learn from. So there's not one of the coaches that I don't trust in and I don't believe that I can get better from. Cole, if you could talk a little bit about your mindset going into your freshman season. So you got a redshirt year under your belt, which uh, you won a couple open tournaments. I'm sure that was a big boost for your confidence. But talk a little bit about making the adjustment from high school to college and just what your mindset is. Do you feel any pressure or are you just excited to go? Um, I don't feel pressure. I think our coaches uh, try to steer us away from feeling pressure and they give us the mindset of just getting better every day, staying consistent, which is what uh, Coach Gavin preaches every day, staying consistent, just getting better, not worrying about win or loss, uh, win or lose. But I like to keep that in the back of my mind and not get too uh, caught up in whatever uh, the media says, I guess. I don't like saying media, but like whatever podcasts come on, but I just like to do oh, my easy own there, thing, Cole. stay consistent. Hey, I'm not taking shots. I appreciate you guys having me. But you know how it goes. You guys are wrestlers. Cole, you already kind of alluded to this, but there's no shortage of talent in the room at Pitt, from the coaching staff down to a lot of the guys on the team, especially around your weight class. You got Drew Headley as a coach, Connor Utsi. These guys are all Americans. You got Mickey Phillippe, the weight class below you, who was a blood round finisher last year, and then Taylor Bermani, who's been at the tournament many times. What do you gain from wrestling these guys in the room each day? Um, the experience of those guys being at the national tournament and the college matches that uh, they've got in. Mickey's wrestled in big matches against like Fix, uh, Fletcher, and he wrestled uh, Tariq Wilson, who's a great wrestler in the ACC finals. But uh, getting to feel their styles, their uh, their age, their uh, aging in the sport, like you understand how. Uh, you wrestle somebody older and you just learn off them, but you're taking a beating at the same time. That's kind of what it is right now. But I'm learning and I'm, uh, I'm trying to get better from them. Since you've got there, you've been there a little bit over a year, um, I guess about a year, you know, three months since the summer last year. What, what are the biggest improvements that you've made uh, wrestling the guys like Mickey and, and Romani and everyone else? I think my offense has improved a tremendous amount. I came into college with, a little offense, maybe a sweep single and a high crotch, but I really developed my hand fighting setups, uh, just trying to get the guy moving and get to my leg attacks more. I didn't do that enough in high school, which I feel like I could have uh, done better, but I'm learning, and hopefully I can put up a lot of points this year and get them bonus points and just be a uh, contender for an All-American Cole, with uh, you know, you're, you're improving obviously your hand fighting and your offense. I don't know if you want to give away any any secrets, but I mean, is there a focus of anything that you're still working on right now, or still need to improve? Uh, I think my hand fighting, moving my feet more, um, getting the guy moving is really what I need to keep working on. I've been working on that every day with the coaches. Uh, they remind me whenever my feet start getting slow, but offense really, just all around offense getting one or two shots starting off with and then this development in uh, my whole arsenal of uh, offense. Cole, what would you say is the morale of the Pitt Panther program right now? I mean, you guys, you have an interesting mix on your team. You've got some veteran guys like Taylor Bermani, like we just talked about, who's been around for a while. He's been at the national tournament a bunch, but you also have a bunch of young studs on your team, like Nino, obviously, in the blood round. Mickey, these guys were just freshmen last year. Yourself, and then there's a lot of good recruits that have come over to Pitt just in the last year or two that are kind of waiting in the wings, so to speak. What what would you say is the morale of the program right now? I wouldn't say there's a more morale to it, but it's uh, we're having fun and we're enjoying uh, making each other better. We know the program's uh, going up, which is great, and we're getting all these big recruits, and they understand that we're going to be winning soon, so who wouldn't want to join us right now? Are there any competitions that you're looking forward to most this season specifically, or are you just looking to get out there and just start getting that hand raised? All of them. I love all of them. Obviously, uh, through junior high, high school, you have a state tournament, uh, maybe some national tournaments, but as a red shirt, you're kind of on the bench, right? I mean, did it hurt at all not being able to have a postseason or a 
like a goal to go towards for the year or did you just expect it and, you know, live with it, I guess? Yeah, I knew that was, uh, one of the things that came with red shirting, but I knew I was getting better at the same time and I was learning. So I couldn't be too mad about it. I mean, this whole year has made me a better wrestler. So I'm not going to think of a red shirt year as a, a bad year. It definitely helps me. So I'm excited for this season. I'm excited for postseason. I'm excited to see our team uh, really uh, reach our goals this year. Cole, kind of to wrap it up, I'll just kind of leave this as a platform for you to give kind of a, a sales pitch for the pit wrestling program, if you will. Um, any prospective recruits out there, these young high school kids that are thinking in the next year or two that they're going to have to make a big college decision, what would you say to those guys out there that you know they want to win in college, they want to be champions? What would you say to have them come join the Pitt Panther family? I know it sounds a little cliche, but uh, it really does feel like a family thing here, just like it uh, did at Reynolds. That's why I enjoy this place so much. And we're winning. We're going to start winning, which is even better. But we're going to be competing for a top 10 spot very soon. We have hardworking guys. We got uh, national championship level guys on our team right now. So who wouldn't want to come and learn, get better, and be the next guy up? Thanks a lot for coming on, Cole. We appreciate it. We'll be rooting for you. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Great, Cole. We appreciate you coming on, and you know, good luck this year. I obviously live in the area, and I'm looking forward to coming down and watching you guys. We're actually bringing uh, the North Allegheny Elementary team. We're going to get as many people as possible for that NC State Saturday night match. So looking forward to that. That'd be awesome. Bring everybody. Take care. All right, and we just got done talking to Cole Matthews. We really appreciate him. Being on the program, he is a redshirt freshman. We'll be wrestling 141 for the Pitt Panthers this season, and everyone in the PA wrestling community is not only excited about him stepping on the mat this year, but definitely expecting big things from him. So, Cole, we thank you for joining us. With that being said, Rob, we are going to go ahead on to our next section of the podcast where we're going to dive into our weight-by-weight preview. So here, we're going to take a look at We're going to get through all the weights eventually. For tonight's episode, we're going to jump in with just the first five weight classes. So 125 through 157. We're going to take a look at around the top five, maybe some extra miscellaneous guys thrown in there. But we're going to preview who we feel are the top five Pennsylvania natives at each weight class. So we're not just looking at, you know, guys from Penn State that are originally from uh, New Jersey, but we're looking at guys that are PA born and bred uh, Pennsylvania products that you'll see out on the mat in college wrestling this year. So with that being said, Rob, you want to start us off with the lightweights at 125? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first guy that we have to talk about is Spencer Lee, two-time national champ. You know, he's definitely a guy that looks like could be in contention for the Hodge this year. I mean, what can you say about this guy? He he has a chance, I think, to make the Olympic team. Uh, You know, he's going to be pushed by Piccinini and by Sebastian Rivera, but Spencer just seems to know how to win when it matters most. So, I mean, great guy and just incredibly fun to watch. He's going to be uh, really someone that's looking to lead Iowa back into into the team race, so to speak. You know, a couple other guys. You got Corbin Myers uh, now at Virginia Tech by way of Edinburgh, by way of Boiling Springs High School. Uh, he's a three time qualifier. He went one and two twice at the Nationals and two and two. He's a perennial top fifteen, top twenty guy. I, I look at him and say, you know, he beats who he's supposed to and loses who he's supposed to. Outside of win over Philippi last year, he's been pretty steady. Uh, not a ton of big upsets, but doesn't lose matches he's not supposed to. Uh, but maybe the change of weight will, will help him jump levels and, and get on that podium because I, I think he's ready to break through. It's just you know, something has to change for him. Uh, Luke Warner, uh, Bethlehem Liberty product now at uh, Lock Haven. Uh, he's a 56-24 and 24 career record. He hasn't qualified for the NCAAs yet, but had nine tech falls last year. Uh, Russell's in a, a very deep MAC conference at 125. I really think he will qualify this year. He was right on the edge last year and is just part of a, a really tough Lock Haven team. Uh, Jake Gramacki, uh, similar to a Mickey Philippi, where he just seems like he's been around forever. Uh, he was a qualifier for Clarion in 2017. Uh, he's by way of Erie Cathedral Prep, by the way. Uh, 2018, got hurt and didn't wrestle at all last year. Uh, started his last year pretty strong. He got a win over Zeke Moisey. Uh, again, he'll be battling with Warner for the the MAC title and, and maybe a PSAC title if they decide to wrestle in that this year. And then last but not least, and, and this is in no particular order outside of Lee at, at the top, I think, but Gage Curry. He's coached by uh, North Allegheny legend T. 
Teague Moore, and he's from North Allegheny Rival School, North Hills, here in southwestern Pennsylvania. A career record, 45-29. and 29. Uh, He's never won a match at the NCAA tournament, but uh, he, he's consistent. He's tough. I think he's a guy that you can look to really break through and jump into that top 20 this year and maybe even more. Tristan, look, look at these 125-pounders. Who jumps off as exciting to you, or what are your thoughts on them? Well, first off, I'm definitely excited to see Corbin Myers make the move down to 125. He's a local kid for me here out of Boiling Springs, which is just right up the road, literally, from where I went to high school at Cumberland Valley. Um, not only a really good kid off the mat, um, really hard worker, but definitely a talented wrestler. And, uh, you know, he's been a kid that has now qualified, what, three times, did you say, Rob? Um, he's always been in the mix. He's been a top 20 guy almost every year. Um, one thing for me that I always saw, I don't know, maybe strength was a little bit of a factor at 133 because I know he was, he was pretty small in high school, like a 119 pounder, I think. And, uh, maybe making the move down to 125 is in his best interest and maybe he will be able to be, you know, bigger for the weight class as opposed to being one of the smaller guys. So I'm really excited to see Corbin. He's a great kid. I hope, uh, the best for him. Hope 25 really does work out for him and he's wrestling for Virginia Tech. So obviously that's a great program. Um, also, who was I going for here? Luke Werner and Gramacki from Lock Haven and Clarion. I just want to throw out, it is definitely interesting to see those Pennsylvania schools competing in the MAC this year. I, as an Old Dominion alum for two years, did compete in the Mid-American Conference. So, um, you know, that's a, a conference dominated by Midwestern schools, as the name would suggest. You got Northern Illinois and um, Eastern Michigan and Kent State and Mizzou now. So it's going to be interesting to see this year that um, conference switch take place here with some of these Pennsylvania schools. No, I, I agree. It's a fun conference. It's um, you know, it's just a bunch of tough kids and tough schools, right? They're maybe not look at the prestige as the bigger ones, but you know, well coached programs. Uh, jump into one thirty three. Uh, you have Luke Pletcher. He's a senior here at Ohio State by way of Latrobe, PA, or Latrobe. Uh, I call him the L- Rodney Dangerfield of this 133 pound weight class last year. He didn't really get a whole lot of hype. Uh, although he's very solid, he, he was fourth as a sophomore and was fourth again last year. And you know, what a lot of people say was the toughest weight in the country took a few losses last year, but you know, avenged some of them throughout the year. You know, what I'm interested in seeing is how he does with Seth gross because gross is back. I think gross is the overwhelming favorite, assuming everyone red shirts that, that you expect to with Michich fix Suriano. Um, but, Pletcher, he's got a tough style. He's tough to score points on. Gross is kind of wide open. So if Gross makes a mistake or two, he can give up a few takedowns. It'll be interesting to see if Luke can hold him off. Uh, 33, I'm going to say Austin DeSanto or uh, Gavin Teasdale. Depending on what DeSanto does, there's rumors he might go up to 41. Uh, you know, Starting with him, I think he's a finalist weight or finalist candidate at either weight, but his best chance of winning might be at 41. I think his style plays into Gross a lot. He's going to get in a lot and and roll around. I think Gross will take advantage of that. But Teasdale, I mean, that's an interesting one. I'll talk about him for a second. You know, obviously he was at Penn State last year. It didn't really work out for a number of reasons. But, you know, from what I heard, it wasn't really a talent issue or uh, an issue of his skills. He was doing fine in the room. It was just, you know, getting down to weight and maybe some extracurriculars off the mat he really struggled with. So if he gets in that lineup, it'll be interesting to see him and, I mean, him versus Bravo Young might be the most anticipated match of the year, just with all the history there. Uh, we got Mickey Phillippe. Uh, don't want to talk too much about him. We talked about him earlier, but, you know, a guy that's, that's probably looking to get on that podium pretty high. DJ Fellman, uh, another Lock Haven guy by way of Warren, PA. Uh, he was 2-2 two and two at the NCAAs last year. He beat Chaz Tucker, who was a, a top 8 or 9 seed, I believe. Uh, beat his teammate, Kyle Shoup, during the year. Warner's, or Fellman's tough. He's, I, I think, similar to a guy like Myers to me where it's like, he doesn't lose bad matches, doesn't win a ton of big ones, but he's looking to make a jump and that, that lock haven team just keeps getting better. So, you know, wouldn't be surprised to see him, you know, jump up a notch or two. And the last guy is uh, Zach Trampe. Uh, he was four and five as a true freshman. I honestly coming into the year, I, I didn't expect a lot out of him and he ends up making the national tournament. He did go and two, but with 16 and six on the year, uh, he's a stingy guy. He's really long for the weight, and he knows how to win matches. I-, I was impressed with him last year. He did a lot better than I expected. Uh, Tristan, here at 133, uh, what's on your mind? 
Definitely the the DeSanto Teasdale discussion is interesting. I mean, I guess we're not really going to know what's going to happen, and we I mean they might not even know when the season starts what's going to happen. You see lineup changes happen throughout the year all the time, so that's definitely a storyline that everyone's going to be keeping their eye on, and we definitely will keep our fans as updated as we can, especially um, knowing that that's two PA boys right there in an Iowa Hawkeye singlet halfway across the country battling it out for a spot potentially. And that also affects, as I'm going to get into here in a minute, our 141 preview. Iowa has Max Murin, who's also a Pennsylvania product. So you're looking at four guys at, from 125 to 141, all from Pennsylvania, um, scrapping to crack a lineup at Iowa. When's the last time that that's happened? I, I don't know. That would be a trivia question for somebody. Um, other than that, you pretty much touched on everything, Rob. Uh, side note, I met, um, I was standing in line in the NCAAs in Pittsburgh this this past March, um, with Zach Trampy's mom, met her really nice people. So, uh, wish him the best. And yeah, I think he, um, he won a loaded 132 AAA PA state title. Um, what was that two or three years ago in a weight where it was wide open and he really emerged and came out on top. So I definitely think just from that tournament alone that he, uh, he's a tough kid and he can win tough, close matches. So definitely look for him to improve, um, from a solid freshman start. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he made a big jump this year from, you know, his true freshman year where he didn't wrestle well till his red shirt. So we'll see if he makes a bit, another big jump. Now I'm going to take us up to 141. Our top dog is Kyle Shoup from Lock Haven. He is also a local product for me out of Boiling Springs, like I spoke about with Corbin Myers. Um, Shoup, wow, what, there's so much to say about Kyle Shoup. He is now going into his senior year, I believe, um, up to 141. Comes in ranked fifth in the nation by Flow Wrestling. Um, he's a definition of a guy that I would say just, uh, you know, I grew up at Ken Churto's wrestling camps my whole life. Um, he always had those t-shirts that say rise to the occasion on the back. I'll never forget those shirts, but I would say Kyle Shoup is, is the poster boy for someone who rose to the occasion last year at the NCAA tournament. Um, came in as not a very high seed, but just, just picked people off the entire tournament and, and it wasn't even close. I mean, he, let's see, he started off with a win over, Matt Finley from Utah Valley, who was an eventual blood round finisher, but then he goes up against the fourth seed, Josh Albert from U and I, who a lot of a lot of people had picking finish really high, as his seed would suggest. And nineteen to ten, I believe, was the score. Shoop got on top and just tilted him and tilted him and tilted him, and it, I mean, it was just a display of PA top work dominance over a Midwest kid. Is the best way I can describe it. And then after dropping a hard loss to uh, Missouri's Jaden Ironman, he dropped down and. And uh, dismantled Cade Brock from Oklahoma State, who was the 15th seed. I'm pretty sure he went down in that match by, I want to say, five or six points. And then just got on top in the second or third period and just scored like 10 points off tilt and ended up winning a high-scoring bout. Um, And then after dropping a loss to uh, Dom Demas from Oklahoma, he goes in the seventh-place match. You know, people think maybe this guy was lucky to sneak into the All-American rounds. Maybe he's going to toss a talent now, but... He goes in in the seventh place match against now a two-time All-American, Chad Red from Nebraska, and does the same thing. I think it was an 11-3 major decision. Just gets on top and just dominates. So um, just to use a historical reference here, Rob, I'm sure you remember Jake Patisil from Purdue, that real lanky guy with a super strong grip that, you know, he was average, above average on his feet. But when he got on top, you know, it could be a tech fall in the in the period. Um, just tilt, 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 tilt. And that's kind of what Shoop is like for me, and I watch him wrestle. You can just see the determination on his face to get that. I watched him at the uh, Arizona State Lock Haven duel that they had here at the local Red Lion High School, and he was just absolutely determined to get that bonus point victory for his team and just get that tilt on top. So, so much you can say about Shoop. Good for him. Um, really blossomed from a definitely a quality high school wrestler, but now he's among the elite in the nation. And then moving up here, Max Murin from Iowa. I briefly touched on him from Central Cambria. He's ranked ninth as a sophomore if he does compete for Iowa at 141 this year. Um, solid freshman year, entered the NCAA 17 and 10. Um, but really, I think he was overlooked going into the NCAA tournament. But as a 22 seed, he pulled off back to back upsets. He beat the Tristan Moran kid from Wisconsin and then upset a fellow Pennsylvania boy, number six seed, Mikey Carr from Illinois, to reach the quarterfinals. And then did drop two hard losses to Nick Lee from Penn State and Chad Red, both by a score of four to one. But uh, a blood round finish for a redshirt freshman, obviously a great performance nonetheless. So big things for Max Murin coming this year. Also, if he does stick in the lineup at 141 for the Hawkeyes. 
I just mentioned Mike Carr from Illinois. He was in the blood round two years ago. Lost in one of the most wild blood round matches I think I've ever seen to uh, Sidarion Perry, who was at that time for Eastern Michigan. He's now an Old Dominion Monarch. But uh, he was just, I mean, milliseconds away from being an All-American as a freshman. And then last year um, went 2-2 two and two at the tournament. So came in as a six seed, though. So he's obviously a guy that's always ranked high and is always a contender. Another guy we have in this weight class, Cole Matthews. We talked to him in our interview. He's coming in as a redshirt freshman as a highly touted recruit out of Reynolds for the Pitt Panthers, and he enters the season ranked number 22 by Flow Wrestling. And lastly, an interesting guy here, Brian Courtney um, for UVA. He's now a redshirt sophomore. He's moving up a weight class. He is from Athens High School. Where he was a definitely a big-time recruit in the PA AA sphere. Um, after redshirting, he, he wrestled about – eight and three records so he wrestled about 11 matches last year before succumbing to an injury but uh this guy is super talented and one um individual match that really stood out to me was he lost seven to five to wyoming's all-american montori bridges who has been a top 10 guy ever since he stepped on the mat in college wrestling and uh that's an impressive um score there even if he lost seven to five he's right there with the best guys in the country so Interesting to see him coming back from an injury, moving up a weight class. But overall, I would say 141 is a pretty stacked weight for PA natives. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I could get really long-winded here. The Pataskill reference was great. I remember watching him. He was a year or two older than me in college. And, and yeah, same thing. It's like the, he's just some big Gumby guy, but he'd get a wrist and, and kind of you know score a bunch of points. Um, yeah, Iowa, obviously we touched on this. 141 will be really interesting. Uh, Mikey Carr, I'm looking forward to him. I, I like that kid a lot. I don't know if he was a little bit injured last year or what, but he didn't seem to have the same juice in the second half of the year, uh, and he missed some time too. He he wrestled Jaden Ironman to start the year, lost a close one, didn't wrestle till Vegas. I think he lost him again, then defaulted out. So it'd be interesting to see where he ends up and how he looks. But yeah, uh, I mean Kyle Shoup, he's got to be a guy that's an outside title contender just with how he scores on top. It'll be interesting to see if teams kind of scout him out a little bit, but I don't know if it matters. When you're that good on top, you get on once, you can score points in bunches, and it really blow matches open. Let's move up to 149. Uh, definitely some interesting guys to talk about here. Um, we'll start with the veteran Brock Zacherl for Clarion. He's now a senior. He comes from Brookville High School, also a double-A stud um, from years back. Uh, Fifth-year senior, ranked number four by Flow Wrestling. Uh, I wrote here in my notes, a never-ending career, it seems like. Zach Earl's been around for a long time. He's always been a really tough guy. Um, I mean, even going back to freestyle, I remember him and Joey McKenna with that kind of controversial um, wrestle-off to make the, I want to say, the junior world team years back. But, I mean, whether it's folk style or freestyle, Zach Earl is a stud. He's always a guy that everyone knows. Um, blood round finisher a year ago. Will he finally get over the hump? Um each year he goes to the NCAA tournament, uh, he usually comes in with a really good record. And I want to say maybe that's the only thing I could say that has been a drawback for him in his career is that I don't know that he's had the competition that bodes well for just uh, you know that grueling three-day NCAA tournament. I feel he always comes in with a high rank, a high seed, and a, and a good record, but um, has fallen short a couple times now of All-American status. But I really hope and think that this might be his year to really get over that hump and really do some damage in the high ranks on the podium at the NCAAs this year. And now, kind of on the flip side of that coin, you got a veteran guy, and now you talk about maybe the most exciting guy to talk about in this entire preview. Um, definitely one of the ones that PA wrestling fans have just been on the edge of their seats waiting to see him get out there in collegiate action uh, out, outside of his redshirt year is Sammy Sasso for Ohio State out of Nazareth. One of the biggest recruits coming out of Pennsylvania probably in the last 10 years. Ranked fifth already by Flow Wrestling as a redshirt freshman. Has not even competed technically um, <coughs> outside of his redshirt season. He's already ranked number five. He went 19-2 and two as a redshirt. Won titles at the Edinburgh Open and the Michigan State Open. And uh, his only losses of the season came to, listen to this, Micah Jordan from Ohio State, his teammate, 9-7. to seven. That guy... You know, what, three or four-time All-American? And uh, his other loss came to a fellow um, super freshman, Arizona State's Ja'Cory Teamer, 8-6. to six. And I know those guys duked it out in high school as well back at, I want to say, Super 32 and maybe who's number one. So those two have had a history going back and forth. But aside from that, I mean, Sasso posted 
wins over multiple NCAA qualifiers. He beat Henry Polmeyer from South Dakota State. He beat Josh Maruka from Arizona State. Uh, he beat Pantaleo from Michigan and Pat Lugo from Iowa. Those are veteran guys with All-American finishes. So this guy is ready to go, and he's probably one of the most exciting wrestlers to watch. Even with those losses, like I said, 9-7 to Micah Jordan, even if he's losing, he's putting up points. He's exciting to watch. So we're all on the edge of our seats for that guy. Uh, moving up, also Josh Maruka from Arizona State, who I just mentioned. He's from Franklin Regional. He is finally in his senior season and comes in ranked number 17. He's a guy that's always been solid, um, looking to get up there, maybe crack All-American status, similar to uh, similar career to his teammate Christian Pagdaleo, who finally made the podium last year. Those are both guys that have been around household names for the Sun Devils for years, but you know have been at the tournament, just haven't cracked the top eight. Also, we got Sammy Krivis from UVA. He is from Hempfield High School. He is now a redshirt senior. Hard to believe he's all the way up there now. Ranked number 24 by Flo to enter the season. He is moving back up to 149. Started his career at 49. <coughs> Excuse me. Eventually made his way down to 141, but it looks like he will be back up at 49 for the Cavaliers for his senior year. He's a three-time NCAA qualifier every year. And I was looking through his bio on, on UVA's website, and he's had almost identical records going into the NCAA tournament every year. Last year, he was... Let's see, 16-12 and 12 heading into the national tournament. Every year he has a record similar to that. Makes the tournament, um, falls short of All-American status. Last year he went 0-2 with a pretty tough draw against All-American Mitch McKee from Minnesota right out of the gate. But, um, you know, he's a guy that it was an absolute beast recruit coming out of Pennsylvania. Um, ranked number one or two in his weight class. Couple times state champ. You know, Super 32, three-time state uh, champ, I believe. So, you know, he just hasn't quite lived up to that hype yet. Also, you know, you never know. These guys battling injuries, the wrong weight class. He's shifted around his weight a little bit. Um, really interested to see if in his fifth-year senior year he figures it out and uh, really makes some noise at that weight class. And our last guy that I have to talk about, Jared Verclearn from Penn State. He uh, finished his career at Hempfield as well, although these two were not teammates. They did not overlap. Um, we talked about Verclearn in our Penn State preview, but... You know, he's a guy that is in a stud lineup with the Penn State Nittany Lions. There's going to be high expectations for him. Rob, what do you think of this 149 weight class? There's definitely some interesting uh, competitors here. Yeah, um, Brock Zachrell, was, he was wrestling pretty well last year before he got hurt. I'm glad he got that fifth year. I'm really hoping he busts through. I was listening to a podcast with him a few weeks ago where he's like, I don't want to win, or I don't want to place, rather. I want to win. And, uh, you know, he hasn't done it yet. He hasn't placed, but... He seems determined and in good spirits, and this is a really wide open weight, so I, I think it's anybody's game. Uh, Sammy Sasso, I think you're right. He has a lot of hype. Uh, I have a lot of friends that are not PA guys; they're just wrestling fans, and they love him too. I mean, this guy is really popular. I think the way he wrestles really, uh, really sits well with people, and I'm looking forward to watching him. I know we touched on the Snyder loss of Penn State or of, of Ohio State to Penn State. They need a new face of the program. And if Sammy Sasso can come out and win a title as a freshman or place high. I mean, they need someone to take that over. And I, I think he could be the guy. And if they want to keep up with Penn state and, you know, I was nipping at their heels, they need a, a freshman breakout and, you know, Sasso is as good as anyone. Uh, you know, moving on to 57 though, you know, we have a few guys, the first three guys we're going to talk to have all been on the program before last year. Uh, so friends of the program, I guess we can call them uh, first guy, Hayden Hydley. Uh, he's ranked number one. He's been second as a freshman and, and fourth as a sophomore. Uh, both times lost to Nolf. Last year was obviously razor sharp. I mean, he was right there with Nolf. There's no other way to put it. He was in that match. Uh, Hydley is a guy that's just a workhorse. He's an absolute just brute powerhouse. Very great balance. He's tough to move, and he's very good in all three positions. I think this is his year to break through. And you know, what I've always liked about this guy is I was looking up his youth results uh, a few weeks ago, and I think he was third or fourth at PJWs as a as an eighth grader, and then I don't think he placed as a freshman in PA. He just kept getting better. So, you know, guy that doesn't need to win eight JO state titles to be a be a superstar in college. Uh, Caleb Young, you know, freshman year did not get in the lineup for Iowa. Was kind of stuck between weight classes, but had a great NCAs last year. Had a great year. He was fifth in the country. You know, two wins over Ryan Deacon. Uh, he lost seven times last year. Five of those losses were in overtime or by one or two points. So that shows how tough he is to score on, and, and really he's not an easy out. Iowa needs this guy. They need to put him in the finals. If he could somehow win the bracket, those would be huge points. But, you know, he's just as important to that Iowa team as anyone. 
Uh, you got Zach Hartman coming on next from my alma, alma mater, Bucknell, uh, by way of Bell Vernon, PA. Uh, he had a great start in middle of the season, was third at the Midlands, ended up beating up on Pat Galeo from uh, Arizona State, who you mentioned earlier in the year at the Midlands. Didn't have a great EIWA. He was second. He lost to Humphreys, who he'd beat earlier that year. Uh, was two and two at Nationals. Not terrible for a true freshman, but I, I think he maybe hit the freshman blues, right? And I expect him to, to really be in contention of place this year. I know Bucknell's really high on him. Uh, number four, you got Justin McCoy uh, by way of Chestnut Ridge. He's now at the University of Virginia. Uh, he was 25-3 and three last year, so a really good freshman year. He lost to the National Collegiate Open to Teamer 7-5, to five, similar score to Sasso. Uh, you know, the transitive property doesn't always work, but, you know, he's competitive with Teamer. That's obviously really impress- impressive. I expect him to have a good year. I- I'd be shocked if he didn't qualify. And just, you know, nationally, that weight, 157 for uh, for freshmen. You got David Carr in there and Luan. I mean, McCoy is part of that group coming in. You know, 157 is going to be a little bit of a youth movement, I think. You got Young and Hydley and Deacon and Larry Early kind of sitting at the top, and then a bunch of freshmen they're going to look to break through. Does anyone really catch your eye at 157? I mean, the first two guys, right, they're no-brainers, but anyone else you want to talk about, Tristan? Well, it's definitely uh, fitting that the youth movement starts with Young, right? That's all I could think when you said that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Zach Hartman, um, he was a stud in the beginning of the year. I think he moved all the way up to – I think he was ranked as high as ninth. Um, at one point in the year that was somewhere midway through the season. And I remember just thinking, this is a guy who didn't even win a PA state title, um, in his true freshman year. And he's already ranked ninth. I don't think I was ever ranked ninth. So I was just thinking this guy is very talented. Um, like you said, didn't maybe finish the year that he wanted to, but I mean, he showed from the very beginning that he's, he's among the elite already. So I would, I would say definitely think an all American status for Hartman this year. You'd have to hope, um, and then, yeah, like you said, Hydley, Young, obviously. Hayden, Hayden's a kid, I, you know, I grew up around at the Nittany Line Wrestling Club. I was in probably middle school, and he was like an eight-year-old kid, but he was that little guy showing up to practice every time that, you know, every weekend he'd come in. Uh, I, I feel like, uh, you know, he could correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like many, many, many times he came in with a second-place trophy, and it was always to the same guy, ironically, someone we just talked about, Luke Pletcher. Those two were always at the same weight class. I feel like it was always... Uh, back and forth between them, but I just remember uh, two of them looked like these two little, like, uh, stocky little eight-year-old kids with blonde hair that looked identical, and they were always wrestling each other in the finals of every tournament. So kind of ironic to see them here both headlining um, our preview just at way different weights. But Hayden's a great kid, one of the most down-to-earth kids I know, for especially someone who's as good as he is. And uh, I really agree with you. I think this is his year. He showed last year with that Nolf match. I don't think very many people saw that coming that it was going to be that close and and really put Nolf in danger of actually losing a match um Hayden could definitely win this weight class so yeah that's about it for our uh, weight by weight previews um Rob anything you want to add before we close out for our first uh episode no this was this was a lot of fun hopefully the uh the thousands or I guess hundreds of thousands of listeners really enjoy it and we can uh you know catch everyone's eye that, or everyone's ear rather every week yeah, so that will close up things for episode one. We will come back with episode two where we will be previewing two to three more PA college programs, and then we will also step into our 165 through heavyweight preview the next time we come back. PA wrestling fans, we thank you for your participation and joining alongside us. Definitely give us a like or a share on social media and spread the word about the PA Power College podcast. For Rob Walco. I'm Tristan Warner. Thanks for stopping in.